Hi everyone, this is Corey Johnson from Good Book Mom. Today I am joined by Catherine Butler and Catherine is the author of the Dream Keeper Saga and um, volume three just came out, just released. Um, and actually Catherine, thank you for joining me today. First of oh, all, thank you for having me. <laughs> absolutely. I don't know if I um, was able to communicate with you before, but the Dreamkeeper Saga was my pick for favorite chapter book that I read in 2022. New release, favorite chapter book 2022. I actually tried to email you and then couldn't find your email. Um, <laughs> but so it was my favorite chapter book that was published, these two together, because they were both published last year. Oh, wonderful. Um, I'm delighted to hear that. Oh, yeah. They are so exciting and well-written and fun. And volume three, um, Lost in the Caverns, was just released. Mm -hmm. um so before we dive into um dreamkeeper will you just tell us a little bit about yourself and your family yeah sure so i actually my background I, I grew up not knowing the lord and i grew up um really feeling very compelled by a sense of needing to perform and to accomplish so i actually went into i loved writing and thought that's what i would go into long term but i wound up uh steering off in a different direction. And I am a doctor. I'm, I'm a trauma surgeon by training. Um, but the Lord brought me to himself through my tra training. Actually, I came to Christ after witnessing some awful things in the ER uh, that I couldn't stop and brought me very, very low. And then he then brought me to himself through that whole ordeal and then placed it on my heart uh, when I was in practice that if I wanted to live out my calling to raise my kids in the Lord, I couldn't do that and also work. Um, it just, the, the hours were too rigorous. Uh, my personality is such that I'm not very good at delegating. And so for an abundance of reasons that were really unique to our family situation, I left practice. And since then I've been homeschooling my kids. Uh, and just over the past few years too, he drew me towards a writing ministry, which is also something that I didn't plan but was a way to steward my experiences and my love for words, hopefully to glorify him. And so I'm the mom of two kids, um, eight and 10, and we live in Massachusetts in the woods. And I have two maniacal cats behind me that hopefully won't cause trouble. <laughs> oh my goodness. Can I ask how long ago it was that you left practice? It was 2016, July of 2016. So almost seven years ago. Okay. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That is an incredible story. Um, I it's cannot kindness. imagine some of the things that you have seen. I think about that. I have some friends who are just doctors, not even surgeons, but yeah. how their day to day life is so much different than what I see. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I can only imagine how God used those unique situations to, um, draw him to you. Wow. That's an incredible story. Yeah, Thank you yeah. for sharing. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to take you back. <laughs> oh, no, it's, I mean, it, it's always amazing to me to hear people's testimonies because our mm. testimonies are not the gospel, you know, right, we, right. You know, we do have to remember that they're not, but they are powerful and we can use them to point people to the gospel right. and just the way that um, God transforms lives, mm -hmm. whether it's, mm -hmm. whether it's, you know, completely turning someone's life. Um, in a 180. I mean, God does that for everybody, regardless of if we're raised in a Christian home or not, right. you know, because right. there is a before and an after, yeah. um, you know, it just looks different depending um, on your life. But regardless, um, God's work of regeneration is amazing and incredible. Mm -hmm. And it's just encouraging to hear, um, to hear that from other believers too. So thank you. Um, okay. So you said that you, having a writing ministry was not something that you anticipated. Um, no. So where did the idea for yeah. <laughs> come from? Like this is, these yeah. are so exciting um, yeah. and so well-written. I haven't gotten to three yet. I'm super yeah. excited about it, but one and two are fantastic. So yeah. where did this um, fantasy land come from? Yeah, the, the long and the short of it, it was an attempt to steward a daydream. Hmm. Um, and it came about actually in the whole medical background, I gave that because it's relevant. Because in 2020, when COVID first hit and the cases were surging in Boston, I was asked to come back to work because we were so overrun in our ICUs and I'm ICU trained. And so I reached out to my partners and like, how you guys doing? They're like, if you're available, you're still credentialed, we could use some assistance. 
So I, I went back for a few months and I'm not one of the people who has been involved in COVID for long term and who is burnt out and really, I mean, people were just so overwhelmed for so long. Uh, and I wasn't one of those people. I was sticking my finger in the dike, you know, for a couple of months. Uh, but my my son was old enough to understand what was going on with COVID. And he really was scared. He was worried about me getting sick because we didn't know a lot about the disease and its communicability and everything else then. And he was so distraught by it that it he, it actually started to upend his faith. He started to really struggle with some doubts. And was wondering, you know, if if God really exists, how could he allow this? You know, if he's really good, why would this be? And he really struggled. So as any disciple of Christ should do, the first thing we did was we went to the scriptures. And so that summer we studied Job. We looked at passages like John 11 with Lazarus is raising from the dead, but Jesus waits for him to die because there's an even bigger plan. You know, all of these passages, we emblazoned Romans 8, 28 on the wall, you know, it's just looking at God, God's goodness and faithfulness in the midst of suffering, most beautifully expressed through the gospel, obviously, that Jesus suffered for all of us. But in the setting of this, we were also reading The Return of the King. So I would go, I was working nights, so I'd work 14 hours in the ICU at night, come home, crash for a few hours, wake up and try to spend time with the kids before going in for another shift. And we cuddle up on the couch and we would read a chapter from Return of the King. And there's this one scene when Minas Tirith, Minas Tirith is under siege and the writers of Rohan come sweeping down to their aid. And the way Tolkien writes it, there's this very ominous foreboding atmosphere and everything is gloomy and it looks like there's no hope. And then all of a sudden the entire landscape changes where he talks about that the dawn broke and there was a wind off the sea. And then the king of Rohan comes riding down to their aid like shining armor. And Jack and I, my son and I both started crying. And he said, can you read that again? And I'm like, why are you crying, buddy? He's just like, it's, I don't know, it's just so beautiful. And I said, you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of the truth that even though things may seem dismal now, we're never without hope because our savior has already come to our rescue. And it was just this beautiful moment of realizing that scripture is primary, but once we've, we, once we've given our kids the scriptures and they know the gospel, really well done stories with Christian themes can help to cement those truths and bring them to mind with really vivid imagery when they most need them. And so knowing that and having witnessed that and seeing the influence it had in my own family um, and realizing, I started to think a lot about story. And I started thinking about the fact that, you know, when C.S. Lewis wrote, wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, he didn't sit down and say, I'm going to write a very theologically rich allegorical series for children. It started with, he had an image in his head of a fawn holding an umbrella. And he was asked, he then paid attention to it and said, who is this character? And then the stories evolved from there. It was really just him pausing and not discarding a daydream as we adults are so apt to do because we're so important and life is so serious. And so then driving to work on one of these shifts, I had an image in my head of a little girl walking into her kitchen and finding a dragon. And that's what started it. And instead it was one of those things I would have dismissed and be like, get back to the real world and focus and do what you need to do. And instead I started asking questions. Um, you know, who is this girl? Why is there a dragon there? What is going on? And and that's how the story evolved. And I just started writing. <laughs> and the the first book bloomed from that. And so it was, again, really just unexpected. It was very much, I feel like the Lord's bidding to go in this direction. Wow. And so you have, <laughs> you have no, like, history of writing you're not trained you don't have a background not in not not fiction so i i had previously uh written two non-fiction books so when i left practice i i had always loved writing i should say so in high school that's what i was planning to do and then my dad suffered a heart attack and i wanted going into medicine instead but i had been to writers conferences that were so highly selective in high school and had competitions. I wrote my first book when I was 17 and won a college scholarship for it. It was not published. It will never see the light of day because it was terrible. But, <laughs> but I like I, I process and I think through through the written word. It's how I kind of understand what's around me and pay attention and incorporate 
what I see with what I understand. Um, so there's always, there's always been that passion for it and that proclivity to do it. But I put it to side when I was in practice. And then when I left practice, I had the headspace all of a sudden to think about and contemplate what I'd witnessed in the hospital and how faith played a role in it. And I started writing um, for myself really to try to process things that I hadn't had the space uh, or the freedom to do in the past. And so I started actually writing just devotional or articles, trying to grapple myself with some of the things I'd seen in the hospital that were hard. And I started to wonder, well, maybe some people will benefit from this. And so I sent my first few to Desiring God and they took me on. And so I became a contributor there. And then from there, uh, pitched them an, an article series on end of life care. And they very kindly said, you know what? We think there's more to this. They asked that I write a proposal for a book mm. and they sent it to Crossway. And that then became my first book contract and relationship with the publisher. So I had already written two nonfiction books before this point. <laughs> and so when I wrote... When I wrote the first Dreamkeeper book, I had the connections already. I had an agent. I just gave it to him. I'm like, here, like, what do you think? I wrote this thing. Is it worthwhile? Um, and we didn't think initially that Crossway would be interested because they're so focused on um, theologically rich, you know, academic works. <laughs> and the editor, to be fair, when he first looked at the first, he's like, what is going on? You write books about death and dying and suffering and you've got a, a dragon eating chili. What has happened? <laughs> you know, but they actually uh, they actually really liked the manuscript once they read it. And so it went from there. It was really God's kindness throughout. Oh, that's wonderful. And yeah. I, I love seeing publishers. I, I feel like we're sort of inching our way there. Publishers that are really solid. Mm -hmm. um and picky about what they publish who they publish right. um they care about theology and we're seeing them dabble in fiction now and i am so excited about that because we need we just need more good christian fiction right um right. that because there's a lot of bad yeah <laughs> no. like there is yeah. there is uh, um <laughs> and and so to have publishers that are solid willing to go into that space is huge um and yeah, so I'm so yeah. glad that Crossway was on board uh, oh it's I'm so delighted too they've just been so wonderful like every step of the way and and the, with the design team to the edit they've just been so lovely as they are they're just lovely to work with but uh it's been a real joy oh that's fantastic yeah. so for those of us who have read books one and two um mm -hmm. number oh did I get there yeah I got them wrong there one and two there we go book three um what can you give us like maybe just a little teaser about book three if we haven't um, yeah. read it yet? Yeah, yeah. So so book two ends with the tomb of Pax is in splitting. And so when she comes back, I don't think it's gonna be a secret. He's risen. Um, but the, the main conflict for Lily personally in book three is her wrestling with the path that she thinks is right, that seems right to her is not where Pax wants her to go. And so a lot of it from a theological standpoint is wrestling with trusting in the path that Pax has laid out for her, that God lays out for us, uh, even though it's not what she would choose um, is, is the main one. And she winds up wanting to go back and use her skills to rebuild the realm after it's been torn apart by this horrible disease, the blight. And that's what she thinks she's there for. And Pax says, no, that's not why I brought you back. Hmm. And she doesn't feel equipped for what he wants her to do. She bucks against it. She winds up going off on this adventure that leads her to caverns throughout the entire realm and up against enemies she never anticipated. Um, and a lot of it is about trusting that his plan all along was the perfect plan, even though it's not what she foresaw. Oh, wonderful. Oh, I cannot wait to dive in. Um, these were so easy to read through. There are some books that I knew that it's <laughs> that, that I'm... I make time to sit down and I have to get through them. Um, these were a joy to read oh, um, because I was looking forward to finding out what happened next. Um, <laughs> they were just lovely. Um, so book number three, do we have a, um, 
do we have a scope of how many books there will be? Five. Five. Um, fourth is four is written and is going to be released in, in March. And I am try I'm working on five now. <laughs> Lord willing, there will be five. Okay. <laughs> and I'm working on five now. I'm, I'm that I anticipate will be the last book, provided the Lord helps me to finish it. <laughs> okay. Well, we can yeah. we can all say a prayer for you then. <laughs> Thank you. I need it. Because <laughs> we want resolution to the story for sure. <laughs> sure. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so five books total, Lord willing. Mm -hmm. That's very mm -hmm. exciting. Um and is there anything maybe in the future beyond that for you writing fiction? Do you oh, have? Oh, goodness. I don't know. I'm kind of, because all, all of this has been, is, I hope you can see, really unexpected for me. And I've, I've kind of, I'm sure probably, but what project I think it's going to be the Lord's leading. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd love to do, at some point before, you know, putting Dreamkeeper behind, I'd love to almost put it together an anthology of stories uh, based on the Dreamkeeper, like short stories, hmm. uh, looking more at Cedric's history with like clear discussion questions for each for families, uh, hmm. maybe focusing on a, a, a an excerpt from scripture. I have that in my head, but uh, I think I need to finish this series first before I take anything else on. Um, okay, one I, thing at a time, but that's yeah, sounds... pretty much, pretty yeah. much. <laughs> that sounds probably, very cool. probably, but but um, you know, I think I think because of my history with being so forced for so many, so focused for so many years on achieving the next goal and medical school and residency. And then the Lord took all of that away and said, no, this is where I want you to be, you know? And I, I, I'm, I'm more low than other people to make long-term plans or commitments. <laughs> and so it, it really, I anticipate probably cause I love the, the fiction, the joy for me. Mm -hmm. It's, very different than my nonfiction work. It's a very different headspace. And it's just, it feels indulgent. You know, like I'm a kid and I'm immersed in a story. I'm going to see what's going to happen next, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's delightful. And so I, I think I would miss it if I walked away from it completely. Um, but it's really, I think as it's all stewardship and it's all service, you know, Lord, okay, what are you giving me? And let me try to steward this well. And it's an offering for you ultimately. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so whatever he then puts in front of me as the next that I'm to steward will be the next project. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. For, I mean, for all of us, really, that needs to yeah, be. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Um, okay. My last question for you, Catherine, mm -hmm. how do you deal with when anybody writes Christian fantasy, they're going to be compared to oh. <laughs> Narnia <laughs> and Lord of the Rings, right? Like, yeah, it's just like, everybody holds Christian fantasy up to those now, like those have yeah. become sort of the ideal, the state, you know, and um, so how do you, how do you deal with that? Um, mm -hmm. Knowing that that's going to happen, um, but also, uh, you know, just being the, uh, the Dreamkeeper saga is, you know, maybe inspired by those maybe not you know how how do you deal with knowing that that's going to happen um and yeah, um honestly if the comparisons are positive i'm over the moon because <laughs> how could i possibly like expect people to compare me to like lewis and tolkien so if you think it's reminiscent of great you know wonderful go read them more even um <laughs> you know and if it's like it's not as good as i couldn't possibly be you know, so I, to me, I, I, the comparisons don't bother me that much. Um, there's some elements, you know, I think people have said Dreamkeeper is, is more reminiscent of Narnia in the sense that there's, there's an Aslan and there's a Pax, there's a Jesus figure. But if we're going to be talking about the gospel and doing it in a, you know, a way through story where it's embedded and woven in through allegory, I think that's unavoidable. There are certain things if you're talking about Christ and he you're going to want to reflect who he is um and so that doesn't bother me so much and is it going to be if if people are thinking of those books and maybe it reignites a joy to go back to them mm -hmm. all the more joy for that and all the more glory for the Lord you know um so it, the comparisons don't bother me if anything when people say it reminded me a little bit I'm just overjoyed because 
uh, my scribblings and whatever my zany imagination is, you know, directing me toward to be compared to scholars like Lewis and Tolkien, who are especially Lewis with his rigorous understanding of apologetics. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can't hold a candle, nor can I try to. I'm just trying to tell a good story that helps families talk about the gospel and talk about, talk about redemption and hope um, and where that hope lies. And so, you know, if the comparison is good, I'm overjoyed. And if it's not, then I'm not surprised. <laughs> oh, I love that though. I mean, just uh, a vehicle for families, you know, story yeah. is so powerful. And yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, a vehicle for families to to talk about the gospel, to talk about redemption. Right. I, I love that that's your heart behind it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Catherine, before I let you go, random question of the day. If I've been calling you Catherine, uh, because that's what people are going to know you. I, but I know you said you go by Katie. Um, yeah. Katie, what yeah. would you, if you could go um, and have any meal for supper tonight, Ooh. what would it be? Oh, what meal? Okay. I thought you were going to say with someone. I'm like, oh my goodness. Oh, um, that's a good one too. You could do that too. <laughs> <laughs> with someone. Oh, that, yeah. Don't ask me that. I don't know. With someone, if it's someone who throughout history, I'd say maybe Elizabeth Elliot. Hmm. Um, what meal? Probably chicken tikka masala. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> How about you? <laughs> you know, I've never had anybody turn my question back on me before. <laughs> I, I'm not sure. Uh, I feel like if it's a meal that I am not preparing, then anything doesn't matter. <laughs> I love to cook. I do. And I love to cook for my family. Yeah. But, you know, if you don't have to make it, man, it tastes oh, it does. that much better, I feel like. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm, I'm with you. I'm there. <laughs> but I do like tikka masala. My family's not yeah. huge into Indian food, but I do yeah. love it. And so I only make yeah. it um, sparingly. But uh, Oh, you make it too. That's amazing. <laughs> oh, well, you know, like the slow cooker version, like not a real, yeah. anybody who's really... A, a chef would probably turn their nose up at mine but it works right. for me <laughs> <laughs> sounds good <laughs> well katie thank you so much for joining me today um i cannot wait to dive into number three and we are so looking forward to books four and lord willing five um <laughs> uh, but thank you so much uh for chatting with me um and for the series and just your heart um for families uh behind it uh, pointing people to the gospel. We just, um, at, at Good Book Mom, I just so appreciate um, not only books that are written well, um, but that point people to Christ, that point people to the biggest story, the best story um, ever. So thank you so much for chatting with me today. Thank you, Corey. And thank you for all you do. I, just, I was gushing to you before we got on here, but I, I'm so grateful for your ministry. So thank oh, you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Take care.